So, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Chris Sagoyan. I'm the principal technologist for the Speech Privacy and Technology Project at the ACLU. Um, I started last September. Uh, I'm the first ever technologist that the ACLU has had who's focused specifically uh, on surveillance and privacy. I finished a PhD last year, specifically focused on the role that internet and phone companies play in spying on their customers for the government. Uh, it's an extremely timely topic. Uh, so I started last September. Um, the ACLU has been very busy in the last year uh, on surveillance issues. Um, shortly after the Snowden uh, revelations, we were the first organizations to file suit against the National Security Agency, although we were ‑‑ thank you very much. Uh, although we are not the last, uh, several other uh, great organizations have also sued the NSA uh, and hopefully those will keep coming. Um, so today I'm going to be talking um, ‑‑ uh, I'm going to be telling a story. I'm going to be telling a story of how how law enforcement and the government have responded to technical change. Uh, this will be a story in, in I guess three acts uh, and really delves into the relationship between the companies and the governments and the different kinds of relationships because not all companies are the same. Some are friendlier than others to the government. So the first crypto wars. Those of you who uh, are, are a little bit older may remember um, there was a time when you couldn't export strong cryptography from the United States. Um, in the mid 90s, then FBI Director Louis Free um, went before Congress on numerous occasions uh, and warned Congress about the threat of encryption. The widespread use of robust, non key recovery encryption ultimately will devastate our ability to fight crime and to prevent terrorism, Free said at a congressional hearing in 1997. He added, uncrackable encryption will allow drug lords, spies, terrorists and even violent gangs to communicate about their crimes and their conspiracy conspiracies with impunity. In the mid 90s encryption was a technology that the government sought to demonize. They sought to control the spread of encryption uh, and ultimately to pressure companies to modify their products, right? So Free also said the only acceptable answer is socially responsible encryption products that permit timely law enforcement and national security access and decryption pursuant to a court order or otherwise authorized by law. The socially responsible crypto that the FBI backed in the mid 90s looked like this. This is called the clipper chip. Thankfully, the clipper chip failed. Um, Professor Matt Blaze uh, found uh, several significant security vulnerabilities in the clipper chip that meant that it actually wasn't even good um, at protecting people from everyone other than the NSA. Um, and so ultimately the first wave of the crypto wars failed. Congress uh, and the executive branch ultimately did away with the crypto export control rules. Um, in 1996, President Clinton signed an executive order reclassifying cryptography and in the years that followed the rules were further relaxed. Ultimately companies like PGP were allowed to export their technology around the world. Web browser vendors like Microsoft and, and uh, Netscape were allowed to export full 128 bit crypto to anyone except people in Cuba uh, and Iran and a couple other countries. Um, and so really the FBI's initial attempts and the FBI and the NSA were sort of collaborating there, their initial attempts to control crypto failed. Their previous, their previous strategy was let's stop everyone else other than Americans from getting this stuff. If we make it difficult for them to get the technology they won't use it and then we'll easily be able to monitor their communications and get their data. But even after the crypto export control rules were weakened and you could download PGP no matter which country you were, no matter in which, which country you were, it didn't actually lead to the widespread use of PGP. Hands up everyone who uses PGP on a daily basis. And for this audience that's not really, uh, not really that good. I, I'll confess I, I only use it with a handful of colleagues and journalists. Most people who contact me you know, don't know how to use it. Um, and the reason is PGP is really difficult to use. There is a, a a major important study by uh, Alma Witten who is actually now at Google uh, ten years ago pointing out the usability failure of PGP. 
Turns out that when a tool is ridiculously difficult to understand how to use, people either don't use it or they use it wrong. Right? They think they're encrypting when they're not encrypting, which is actually worse because then they will say things that they might not have said if they thought their emails were going through the clear. And so the widespread availability of encryption really didn't frustrate the FBI in, in the way that they thought it would. Terrorists and pedophiles and drug dealers didn't suddenly rush out and start using PGP because it turns out that terrorists and pedophiles and drug dealers are like the rest of us. They're lazy and they're not experts at difficult to use obscure technology. And so PGP wasn't the threat that they thought it would be. Um, HTTPS, the, the, the lock icon that we see in our browsers is easier to use because it doesn't really involve anything from the user's side, but even that wasn't widely deployed. Where SSL was widely used was in e-commerce, online banking. If you were sending your credit card over the web, your communications would be encrypted. But if you were sending your emails, social networking messages, private photos, backing up files, very few of these things would be protected with SSL. Right? And so again, the government had, they had a good time. They didn't have to worry too hard. Although the technologies existed, no one was using them. Or at least they weren't using them for the things the FBI cared about. This is a slide that The Guardian published this week. It's from um, the latest deck that Snowden provided them. Um, this is a deck from, from X Keyscore, which is the, the program they have or the, the intelligence platform that allows them to monitor vast amounts of, of communications and then search for it later. Um, now this deck is from like 19, or sorry, 2008, 2007. So it's a few years old, but what you can see clearly outside of law enforcement and in the intelligence space, these folks appreciated that communications were going over the network in the clear. Whether it was Yahoo or Facebook or Twitter or your emails, they were there easily available for the government to grab with the assistance of their friends at the backbone internet providers. Uh, and so things were good for a while. It didn't really matter that your browser could do strong crypto. It didn't really matter that you could download tools uh, from a website and configure them and then have a key signing party because no one was doing that. But that didn't stop the FBI from worrying because down the road they saw that things were going to get bad. And it wasn't going to be because people could download tools, but it was going to be because companies were going to start building crypto into their products by default. This is Valerie Caproni. Uh, she was until I think a year ago um, the, the general counsel for the FBI, the top FBI lawyer. Um, she's testified before Congress on numerous occasions and in 2011 uh, at a congressional hearing she warned Congress about what they call, what the FBI was calling the going dark problem. Going dark is the FBI's term for what happens when everyone uses encrypted communications. Right? The FBI has coined this term and spent lots of money researching this issue because they're worried about a day in which all of the communications that users are sending are going to be off limits to the FBI. This is in 2001 or 2011, quote, the FBI and other government agencies are facing a potential widening gap between our legal authority to intercept communications pursuant to a court order and our practical ability to actually intercept those communications. The FBI says that they can get a court order, but when they actually try and get the communications, either the company doesn't have the capability because they haven't built wiretapping systems into their networks or the company cannot provide the data. She added, encryption is a problem. It is a problem we see for certain providers. And so what she was describing there um, was the fact that over a, a couple years, starting in 2010, um, companies in Silicon Valley started rolling out SSL encryption by default. Um, in a Washington Post story just um, last year, they uh, a, a former FBI official described this to the Post. Officials say that the challenge was exacerbated in 2010 when Google began end-to-end -end encryption. That made it more difficult for the FBI to intercept email by serving a court order on the ISP whose pipes would carry the encrypted traffic. Right? In 2010, Google was the first 
first of the big free webmail providers to turn on SSL by default. Google had always offered SSL as an option, but it was an option deep in several layers of configuration screens. I think it was the last of 13 options after um, the vacation auto away message, after Unicode. There was nothing um, less important in the Google configuration screen than SSL. Uh, and so, of course, no one used it. When the option was hidden and disabled by default, no one was having, no one's emails were secure between the user and Google. Uh, but in January of 2010, Google flipped the switch and enabled SSL by default. And in the years that followed, several other Silicon Valley companies did the same. It was Twitter. Then Microsoft with their renamed, or they renamed Hotmail to Outlook and they turned on SSL at the same time. Um, Facebook started doing it last year, started rolling it out, and I think just this week announced that um, all Facebook communications will be SSL encrypted from the user um, uh, to, to Facebook servers. Uh, in addition to that, several companies have started rolling out perfect, perfect forward secrecy, uh, an improved algorithm that, that makes it much more difficult uh, for government agencies to go to companies and demand private keys. Uh, they're upping their key sizes. These Silicon Valley companies are making passive interception much more difficult. <laughs> now, of course, that doesn't mean that the government can't get things from Google. Um, your communications between your computer and Google servers are encrypted, but once the files actually arrive at Google, whether it's your emails or your private photographs, or your instant messages, they're sitting there in plain text. This is Vint Cerf. He's Google's, um, I think, their chief internet evangelist. He's also sort of the father of TCP IP. Um, I was on a panel with him in 2011 uh, in Nairobi, and we, we started talking about Google's lack of, of stored encryption. And he said, quote, we couldn't run our system if everything in it were encrypted, because then we wouldn't know which ads to show you. This is a system that was designed around a particular business model. So this is a very honest statement from a Google executive. And I don't begrudge Google, right? They offer a fantastic, easy to use service and they don't charge people for it. And neither does Twitter and neither does Facebook. These companies all offer one and only one product. There's no way to pay for Facebook. There's no way to pay for Twitter uh, there's no way to upgrade your Gmail account to a, uh, to a corporate account, a Google Apps account. They have the accounts for users and then the accounts for businesses. Um, and when the only accounts they, they offer are free ones that are supported by ads, then it makes sense why they're not encrypting your data in the cloud with a key that only you have because it would be very difficult to monetize that. Now, if the, the companies could and maybe will at some point switch to a business model where you give them money and they give you a secure service. But that isn't the business that, that they're in right now. Uh, and so what this means then is that the companies can and do receive requests from law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies. Even before the PRISM revelations, we've known that Google has, gets thousands of requests a year from law enforcement and intelligence agencies. This isn't a surprise. Um, but what we've seen in the last few years is a transition. We've seen a migration away from telecommunications companies to Silicon Valley companies. In years past, your private messages, your metadata would be accessible through a backbone provider, through a telephone company, through one of the Ma Bells, right? And like it or not, the, telef the telephone companies have been providing wiretapping assistance to the U.S. government for more than 100 years. The first wiretaps were around 1895 in New York City. For 100 years, these companies have been providing interception assistance to the U.S. government. And it's a relationship that everyone is sort of comfortable with. Everyone, and by that I mean the companies and the government. Um, and so these companies don't just provide targeted access. They don't just provide access to an individual user's data. They provide, when the government asks, access to all users' data. 
The assistance of the phone companies is what enables dragnet surveillance. When the government wants to search through every email uh, or search through every phone record, that is only possible because the phone companies provide access to everything. If you take the internet companies at their word, the Silicon Valley companies, they only provide targeted access. If the government goes to Google and has a court order with my name on it, Google will hand over my data. But if you take Google at their word, they will not provide access to everyone's information. Uh, and so what's happened over the last few years is that consumers have started to migrate their data from the old telecommunications carriers to Silicon Valley companies. Um, I mean, in many ways, the telcos haven't had people's email for a while. I mean, no one's using a Verizon or Comcast email uh, anymore, really. Um, but when those email messages were going over the network in the clear, it meant the government could still go to the backbone providers. It meant they could still go to the AT&Ts and the Verizons of the world, even if you were using Yahoo or Google uh, or Hotmail. But as these Silicon Valley companies have enabled encryption, you can no longer spy on someone's emails. You can no longer collect bulk information with the assistance of Verizon or AT&T. Uh, and I think a great example of this is what Apple did with iOS version 5, right? In one day, they just flipped a switch and suddenly I, a new version of iMessage was rolled out to users. And if you were an iOS user and you were sending a text message to another iOS user, your messages would go through Apple servers instead of the phone companies. And overnight, millions and then billions of messages started flowing through Apple servers. And those were messages that the government cannot get with the assistance of Verizon or AT&T and Sprint. Now, again, um, this was a, a leak that was, uh, this is a, a document that was leaked to Declan McCullough at CNET suggesting that, um, that the government can never get messages sent through iMessage. I actually don't think that's the case. I think that Apple provides access on a targeted basis, but I don't think they are providing wholesale access in the way um, that the phone companies do. And I think what's happened here uh, is that there's a difference in culture between the companies. It's not that Google is trying to make the government go dark. It's that Google has 350 people doing nothing but doing security and only security. It's that Apple has a dedicated security team. It's that Facebook has a dedicated security team. And before you can launch a product at one of these Silicon Valley firms, particularly if it's storing sensitive user data, you have to have crypto. There's no way to secure your user's data against hackers without crypto. And so these companies have a, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a corporate policy to encrypt data, not because they want the government to go dark, but because that's what the security teams at the companies demand of them. Um, and realistically, the phone companies don't have um, a tradition of security. Your voicemail isn't secure. You're not getting OS updates to your smartphone if you're using Android, which is, by the way, something we filed a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission about uh, earlier this year. The phone companies just aren't interested in security. And so what's happening is consumers are giving their data to companies that finally invest some resources in security, and that's making it tougher for the government. So what is the solution? How does the government respond to a world in which they can only, they can only get selective data from companies, and in some cases they cannot get data at all if the companies are using end-to-end -end crypto? The answer uh, is backdoors. The answer is compelled access, forcing companies to modify their products uh, and, and provide the government with a way of getting data. Um, starting in sort of 2010, uh, we started seeing leaks to the press um, suggesting that the FBI and others in the law enforcement community were floating these ideas. They were floating legislative proposals, expanding uh, CALEA, which is a law mandating backdoors and communications networks, and expanding that to internet companies, to websites and apps and, and, and other providers. Um, we saw sort of these trial balloons floated in 2010, and then ultimately there was a congressional hearing in the spring of 2011 where our friend Valerie Caproni from the FBI testified, quote, no one should be promising their customers that they will thumb their nose at a U.S. court order. They can promise strong encryption. 
They just need to figure out how they can provide us plain text too. <laughs> right? And this is what the FBI wants. They want the power to go to a company secretly uh, and force the company to quietly insert a backdoor in their own product. Um, as recent as this year, as recent as April of this year, um, it looked like proposals were coming. It looked like there was a multi-agency working group in Washington uh, and they were getting ready to drop a bill that would empower um, the Department of Justice to fine Silicon Valley companies that refused to provide the assistance demanded of them. And then something happened. Uh, Kalia 2, which is the, the DC nickname for this backdoor proposal, for now is dead. Um, it is dead in the water. Uh, no politician wants to touch that kind of surveillance uh, for now. So uh, thank you very much, Edward Snowden. All right, so if they can't force Google to put a backdoor in Android OS, and if they can't force Apple to, to put a backdoor in their software, what are they going to do? How is the government going to get your communications? What about when they want to listen into a conversation you're having in your living room where you're not even using your device? Right? Are they supposed to break in in the middle of the night and install a microphone like they did in the 1970s? No. Right? They want other ways to access data, particularly as um, as consumers have started using services like Skype, and we'll talk about Skype later, um, but services like Skype that have some form of encryption, governments have been having problems. And, and remember, the government isn't one big beast. The FBI or NSA may have, a, may have tools to access certain applications, but that doesn't mean they share those toys with local law enforcement agencies, right? NSA doesn't share um, their secret uh, back doors with um, the likes of local cops in Arizona or, or Nevada. Um, those, those folks have to do things the hard way. Um, it's also important to note that not all governments are the same. So um, Google has an office, in fact its main office in California and Microsoft's headquarters in Se is in Seattle. Um, Google and Microsoft have to take orders from the U.S. government. When there's a valid court order, the companies have to provide access to the U.S. government. But Google doesn't have an office in Iran. Microsoft doesn't have an office in Libya. And so if those governments want to get their, their citizens' communications, now that Google and Microsoft and others are starting to use SSL, those other governments are really going dark. In the countries where Google and Facebook and, and Microsoft don't have offices and don't respond to requests, those governments are having a really tough time because of the use of services like Skype like Twitter, like Facebook. They used to be able to get access through their local, in many cases, nationalized telephone company, and now they're going dark. And so those governments are turning to hacking tools too. Um, what we're seeing is an emergence of the private sector helping companies, or helping governments. Um, the ones that have gotten the most press, the first is a company called um, uh, Gamma. They make a software suite called FinFisher. Uh, FinFisher has gotten a lot of press in the last couple of years, starting with a dump of documents by WikiLeaks and then uh, the excellent work of the Citizen Lab in, uh, in Canada have exposed the use of this software. Um, they have a really cheesy sales video um, online that I recommend you look at. But so this is uh, the target using iTunes and then getting a malicious man in the middle to update through iTunes. And then the police officer sitting at the remote operating center um, can spy on the calls and text messages and, and emails of the user. Um, this is the uh, president or I think a, a CEO of Gamma. His name is Martin Munch. Um, you may not know Martin's name, but you probably know Martin's work. Before he was in the government surveillance business, uh, Martin created a Linux distribution called Backtrack, uh, which is very popular with this community. And so Martin uh, pivoted from providing open source security tools to providing closed source government interception tools. Um, this is my favorite photo of Martin. Um, so he's, this, he's a German guy. He 
you know, without any shame, sells this software to uh, governments around the world. Um, and one of the things his software can do is to remotely activate webcams without the, the target's knowledge. Uh, you can see that he's concerned about this capability because if you zoom in uh, on his laptop, you can see he has a little post it note over his webcam. <laughs> he clearly knows what his own software can do. Um, so, because of the work of the folks at Citizen Lab, we know that um, Gamma's software has been exported to, to Mexico. Um, Ethiopia. It's been used by seriously uh, oppressive regimes in the Middle East uh, and, and in Southeast Asia. Now, the company says that it's used for lawful interception and targeting of terrorists and pedophiles and criminals. Um, but it, from what we know, it's been frequently used to target journalists and human rights activists and dissidents. Um, and so Gamma is one of, these, one of these companies providing these off the shelf tools to governments. Right? The police don't have the resources to develop this stuff in house, and so they just buy this off the shelf spyware uh, from companies like Gamma. Um, through the last couple of years, the newspapers have covered this. Uh, the Times and Bloomberg have, have described uh, the spread of this stuff. Uh, and this, the, the, the sale of this technology is, is really uh, unregulated. Um, basically, any government uh, except for the ones on, on international blacklists can buy it. Uh, the other big company uh, is a company called Hacking Team. They're an Italian company. They make something called the Remote Control System, uh, otherwise known as Da Vinci. Uh, they have a, a sales video too that appears to be targeted to 13 year old boys. Um, uh, their marketing stuff says defeat encryption, total control over your targets, log everything you need, thousands of encrypted communications per day, get them in the clear. Um, and this software really is sold to law enforcement agencies who are trying to deal with things like Skype. Right? If you're the government of Turkmenistan and there are journalists in your country who are using Skype to communicate, how do you get the contents of their calls when you need them? The phone company in town can't help you. You go to Gamma or Hacking Team and they provide you these tools. This is again from Hacking Team's literature. They say that they can get encrypted voice, location, audio and video spying, web browsing activities, relationships. They get anything that is on a computer without the knowledge of the target. Um, Hacking Team in recent years uh, has uh, expanded into the US market, uh, I believe. Uh, in the spring of this year, they hired this man. Uh, his name is Eric. He used to be a spokesperson for Verizon. Um, and now he is the U.S. counsel uh, for Hacking Team. Um, they have an office in Annapolis, Maryland, um, just an hour outside of D.C. Um, we don't know whether Hacking Team has successfully sold any products to the domestic U.S. law enforcement market, um, but they are showing up at conferences that are only open to law enforcement and intelligence agencies in Washington, D.C. Um, they also went to a conference in Chicago this April, the um, Law Enforcement Intelligence Units Association. Um, not only did Hacking Team give a talk at this conference, this is a conference targeting local cops around the country, not only did they give a talk at the conference but they also sponsored the coffee break in the afternoon. Um, and so if Hacking Team hasn't sold uh, a product to a local law enforcement agency yet, it's not because they haven't been trying. Right? They've been showing up at these conferences for several years. They are actively targeting the law enforcement market. Um, and I think if they haven't succeeded already, they will uh, succeed soon uh, and, and get a sale in a small town. Um, now, hacking team and gamma software is the kind of stuff that local cops and governments without too much money use. This is, you know, a couple hundred thousand or maybe a million dollars. It's the kind of thing you buy with a DHS grant. Uh, this is not what you use if you are a sophisticated law enforcement agency with big bucks. Uh, and the feds have the big bucks. Federal law enforcement agencies in the United States have enough money to use bespoke custom malware. They don't need to use the same stuff that the Egyptians and the Turkmenistan governments are using. They can use their own custom spyware there and they can buy zero days if they need them. Again, our friend Valerie Caproni, um, there will always be very sophisticated criminals that are, that are virtually impossible to intercept through targeted means. 
the government understands that it must develop individually tailored solutions for those sorts of targets. And when Valerie says individually tailored solutions, what she means is hacking. She didn't use the word hacking when she spoke to Congress, but what she means uh, is hacking and malware. Um, in 2009 or so, I, I think EFF filed one of their many Freedom of Information Act requests uh, to look into the FBI's claims that they were going dark. Uh, and after a, a couple years later, they got um, hundreds of pages of documents, most of them heavily redacted. Um, this is one uh, that I found. So I, I read a lot of the documents that groups like EFF produce and documents that the ACLU obtains. Um, and this was one in several hundred pages that the um, EFF obtained. Um, and most of it was redacted, as you can see. But there was one line that stuck out to me. This, the remote operations unit. So that sounded really interesting. Um, I didn't really know what the remote operations unit was but it was in a document about going dark. This was a, a, a document sort of describing each unit checking in and saying what their progress was. And I, so I thought, okay, let me see what else I can find about the remote operations unit. And so I spent the last six months uh, researching this unit, mainly using open source intelligence, basically just Googling um, and using LinkedIn. And what I found is that the FBI is in the hacking business too. Um, so I found um, a conference, uh, the materials for a law enforcement conference that happened in April of this year. This was a training, a training seminar for prosecutors around the country. And in the list of attendees and speakers at this conference, I found the information for this guy, Eric Chung, who's the unit chief of the remote operations unit. And so I searched a bit more and I found the Zoom info page. This is like a, a, a data mining company that collects information from elsewhere on the web. And, Eric Chung's Zoom info page mentioned that he was the unit chief of the remote operations unit and said that this unit provides lawful computer collection capabilities in support of FBI investigations. Well, that sounded interesting. So then I turned to LinkedIn and I started researching the remote operations unit. What I found is that there are a couple contracting companies, a couple contractors who supply people to the, to the ROU. Uh, and contractors, like everyone else, you know, they, they want to keep their resume up to date in case they get a new job. And so they list things in their resume, uh, maybe things they shouldn't be listing, um, revealing what they did at their old job. So I, I've not included the names of the, uh, of the line item or the, the low level contractors, but I will be quoting from the, um, from the LinkedIn pages of several of these contractors because I think what they describe is, is fascinating. So this is a, de a deployment operations analyst at a company called James Bimmon Associates. They're a small boutique um, contracting company in Northern Virginia. So this person performed testing on software used as a critical function for counterterrorism and counterintelligence cases. Okay, that sounds interesting. He worked with FBI case agents with our surveillance imagery software that is currently installed on criminal subject machines in the field. Oh, okay. That, that, that's even more interesting. Um, they test uh, case-specific implants against various OSs and platforms. Good to know. So if, they're, if, they're, if you're using Windows or Mac or whatever, they have a tool for you. Uh, and then they create documentation for the various technologies and methods that we use to gain access to subject machines. All right, so it's clear. It's clear from this profile what the remote operations unit is doing. I also found another, another person. Um, this is a, a remote operations deployment analyst, also at James Bimmon Associates. Um, uh, her profile uh, was fascinating. I, I thought this was, was good. Cr she created policies, guidance, and training materials to protect the deployment operations tools from being discovered by adversaries. Those are us. We're the adversaries. Um, so Bimmon Associates is one of two companies um, that provides uh, hackers to the FBI. Um, it is my belief and understanding that the companies, um, the contracting companies actually supply the people who sit at the keyboard and are launching the tools. Um, you know, there hasn't been a debate in Congress about the FBI getting into the hacking business. There hasn't been any legislation giving them this power. This just sort of happened uh, out of nowhere. And had it not been 
um, for the sloppy actions of a few contractors eagerly up updating their LinkedIn profiles, uh, we would have never known about this. Uh, so the president of James Bimmon Associates uh, is a guy named Jerry Menshoff. Uh, he used to work at Booz Allen Hamilton, which is also the same place that Edward Snowden used to work. Um, uh, and so uh, this is the president of the company and his LinkedIn profile was pretty bare, uh, but it, it did describe one of his interests uh, and so he's a member of the Metasploit Framework Users Group. <laughs> Thought you guys would get a chuckle out of that. Uh, so I gave Jerry a phone call a few weeks ago uh, and asked him, um, you know, some questions and told, I, I of course told him who I was and I said I work for the ACLU uh, and he wasn't um, very nice. Um, he, he didn't want to answer any of my questions. Um, so uh, I gave some of this information to the Wall Street Journal uh, and last night they published a story on this unit. The nice part of giving these documents to a newspaper is once they have a bit of information then they can go and report it and get other stuff too. And so the, the uh, Wall Street Journal reporter um, was able to find former law enforcement officials who would be willing to talk on background uh, about this practice. One former law enforcement official she, she, dis she spoke to said that, quote, the Bureau can remotely activate the microphones in phones, uh, Android phones, uh, and laptops without the user knowing. It's pretty interesting. Um, but she also added that the FBI is loath to use these tools when investigating hackers out of fear that the suspect will discover and publicize the technique. So I guess that means you're all safe from FBI malware. <laughs> so uh, you know the FBI has this team of agents who are doing nothing but delivering malware uh, to the computers of surveillance targets. Um, we only have uh, a couple cases um, where these tools have have come uh, come to light. There was a case in Texas this summer um, where the FBI sought a search warrant allowing them to target a computer. Um, and remotely enable the webcam, collect location data, uh, collect emails. Um, in this case, uh, they went to what, what you could probably say is the most pro privacy judge in the country, um, in Texas, uh, and he said no. Um, but sort of on a technicality, he said they should get a wiretap and, and, and they only wanted to get a warrant. Um, what's clear is that uh, if you have this capability, if you build this team that does nothing but developing malware, um, the first time you attempt to use the team, you don't go to the most pro privacy judge in the country. Uh, and so, presumably, they've had this team for a while uh, and they regularly use it to deploy malware. So, on one hand, we have the FBI basically being in the hacking business. Uh, and then, yesterday, I noticed that the FBI's official Twitter account uh, issued a warning saying pirated software may contain malware, uh, be, be aware. Um, and so I guess we only have to worry about the malware made by other people, not the FBI's um, malware. All right. So the government is using hacking tools. The government is trying to penetrate people's computers. They have tried and have up until now been unsuccessful in their attempts to obtain um, legislation allowing them to force tech companies to put back doors in their products. What are they going to do in the future? Because hacking doesn't scale. You can break into one person's computer. You can break into a thousand people's computers. But you cannot break into a billion computers without getting caught. You can do it temporarily, but you will get caught. And the government doesn't want their tools to get out. So what are they going to do in the future? What are they going to do when Silicon Valley companies actually start delivering end-to-end -end crypto? Not Google, not Facebook, but companies who actually sell services to users. Well, Microsoft, um, you know, owned one of those companies. For some time, Skype was advertising itself as a service um, that didn't have back doors. They were advertising itself as a service that couldn't provide access to law enforcement agencies. But we learned last month that the government was able to go to Skype before Microsoft bought them uh, and convince them to modify their product and provide access to the government. Quote, from the Guardian story, Skype was served with a directive to comply by the Attorney General. Now we don't know what kind of directive this was. We don't know uh, if they went to court, if Skype said no and they fought it or if they did this because they could negotiate some better deal. We, we really know very little uh, about the ins and outs of how companies can be compelled under existing law 
Um, but even so, um, Skype stopped bragging about their security several years ago. And by the time Microsoft bought them, all their claims uh, of being wiretap proof had disappeared. Skype was no longer a service, even if it ever was. Um, it, was never, it was no longer a service that advertised itself as the way to securely talk to your friends and family. Instead, Skype was a service that you used to talk to your friends and family for free. But Skype is not the only company offering VoIP services or video. There are now companies that are selling services to users. So one of them is a company called Silent Circle, uh, co-founded by Phil Zimmerman, the guy behind PGP. Um, and they charge 10 or 20 bucks a month for encrypted VoIP uh, and text messages uh, and video. Now, I'm not you know, telling you to go out and use this company's services, but they've clearly said in their marketing materials, we have no government mandated back doors. You know, I've spoken to the CEO of the company and he said, you know, if the government comes to us uh, and tries to force us to put a backdoor on our product, we'll close up and move to a different country. I mean, th this is a company, the only reason you use their product is for the security. You're not using Silent Circle because it's crystal clear audio or because it's cheap and easy to use. You're using them because they're secure. Likewise, Spider Oak, which is a competitor to Dropbox, you only use Spider Oak and you only pay for the service because they provide encrypted backups with a key only known to the user. And this, again, Spider Oak makes clear um, uh, statements to users. We've created a system that makes it impossible for anyone to reveal your data, uh, impossible for us to reveal your data to anyone. That's it. The only reason you use these companies is to protect your data, and this is the only reason they're in business. And so the question right now is, and I don't have the answer to this. The question is, can the government force these companies to modify their products? Because if, if Spider Oak were forced to have a back door and it became known, they'd go bankrupt. The only reason you're using them is for the security. Um, and so there's this law that I mentioned it before in passing called CALEA, and it's normally thought of as a bad law. It's called the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. CALEA is the law that forces uh, telecommunications companies to put um, law enforcement interception interfaces in their networks. The reason that AT&T has very easy to use fast wiretapping capabilities is because Calia forced them to buy a bunch of equipment. But Calia has a provision in it that most folks don't know about. And I'm going to read it to you. It's very short. A telecommunications carrier shall not be responsible for decrypting or ensuring a government's ability to decrypt any communication encrypted by a subscriber unless the encryption was provided by the carrier and the carrier possesses the information necessary to encrypt the communications. This little feature in Kalia, I think, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, is the thing that is standing between these companies and the government. This section of Kalia protects the right of companies that want to offer encrypted end-to-end -end services with a key only known to the user to the general public. And it is my belief that when the next crypto wars come, if they do come and when they come, that this section of the law will be the thing that the government targets. Um, I think that down the road, we are going to see consumers using services that offer end-to-end -end crypto. I think we will see people paying for these services. Uh, and I do think that the government uh, is going to target these because without it, they cannot engage in dragnet surveillance. Thank you very much.